going to briefly show how to assess um, the cerebellum or features of a cerebellar syndrome. Uh, once again, uh, I would recommend at all times, you've obviously had a conversation with the patient and you can pick up certain things, but the gait I must emphasize more than anything else. So I've shown on a number of occasions in this uh, video that how to examine a normal gait, but I'm going to talk you to now a person who doesn't obviously have a cerebellar syndrome, but what you're looking for and how to examine it and, uh, through to its end. So once again, Peter, thank you very much for you're coming. Welcome. I'm going to examine your walk and I'm going to talk uh, the students through this as we go along. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind walking f as far as the pillar there, turning around slowly and then halfway, uh, on the halfway back, just stop, okay? And then I want you to walk heel to toe as before. So a bit more slowly this time, if you don't mind, if you could walk towards the pillar, Great. please. So as he walks, I'm looking for the, uh, the width of the gait. It's called a broad base gait in cerebellar syndrome, as if someone's drunk too much. And when they turn, they have to turn on an axis like that because they're always fearful they're going to fall over. Now, the next thing you look for is you ask the patient to stop. Now, this time it's crucially important, as I've said before. You're going to ask them to heel to toe walk again. So could you try that? Now, if someone has a bad cerebellar syndrome, or a severe one, I should say, there's no way they'll be able to do this. They'll take one or two steps and they'll be falling all over the place like this. So don't push it, as I keep saying. The next thing you do, as always, is stand on the toes and on the heels. It won't be relevant here, but what will be relevant and is very important is the Romberg sign once more. So can you put your feet tightly close together? Now this time, I must remind you again that vision, vestibular system, and posterior columns keep you up in space. When your feet are tightly close together and you ask someone to close their eyes, if the posterior columns or the vestibular system are, are afflicted in any way, the patient or the person will fall over. Note, this is not part of the cerebellar syndrome, an, an urban myth, if you will, or a medically, medically urban myth, that the cerebellum, uh, de de deficits of the cerebellum cause a Romberg's positive syndrome. It does not. Now, it can look like it. You must reassure the patients. I often do this. I often say, I'm here, I'm here. They feel unsteady. You say, I'm here, I'm here, and reassure them, and then just step away for long enough to say it's actually negative. So you must give the patient confidence when you're doing that. The next thing you do then, thanks Peter, is, is you ask the patient to relax, be a bit more comfortable. And when you're examining the cerebellum, like most of the neurology system, when you're thinking through it, you start from head to toe. Now, I'm going to ask you to look straight ahead and you look at my finger here, okay? Now what I'm looking for here from the side is the patient's looking at me and I'm looking at the eye movements. Now, at rest, a thing called square wave jerks, tiny little jerkiness of the eyes can occur in the cerebellar syndrome. So I look rather closely, and a lot of students tend to say, there are no square wave jerks, the pupils are equal, etc., and, and they haven't actually looked. So you must take your time, you must breathe easy, particularly in examination situations. So you look very closely. And then another fault uh, students uh, tend to make is when they say test pursuit movements, if you could follow my finger, please, they do it like this, too quick. Nobody can do that, it looks like nystagmus all the time. So what I'm looking for is, look at my finger, not too close to the patient either, I hope, and I ask the patient to keep their head still and follow my finger. And most patients can keep their head still, you don't need to put your hand all over them or anything like that. And what I'm looking for here is flickiness of the eyes or nystagmus. Clearly Peter doesn't have any. Now very slowly, look at the speed, it's very important. I come over here, maybe I'm going even too slowly and I tend to go left and right, just to get a feel for it. At the extremes of gauge, you can get a few little beats of nystagmus. It tends to be overinterpreted by the uh, less experienced. And then if you keep your head still, you go up, head still, and you can have up gaze and down gaze nystagmus. But horizontal nystagmus tends to be more suggestive of a cerebellar problem. The cerebellum uh, also can influence speech, and one gets difficulty with articulation called dysarthria. But dysarthria can be due to problems with your lips, your tongue, your palate, and you have to rule those things out first. So what I tend to do, learning from people more experienced than I, I tend to ask them, uh, patients to say, can you repeat the following fairly clearly and repetitively, obviously. Can you go, ba 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 Okay, so I know the lips and lip function is reasonably okay. Then I ask you to go, ta 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 As you can imagine, that's tongue. And then I want you to go ka 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 Okay, so you know the palate is, is fine. So put that together, it's buttercup, buttercup, buttercup. And that was taught to me by a, a, a very eminent neurologist in London. So if that's all clear and the patient still has difficulty with enunciation or with articulation, 
then you can say, well, I wonder if this is a cerebellar syndrome, and you look for the full package. Of course, things don't come uh, wrapped in full packages, as we see in our textbooks, but you put them all together. The next thing I tend to do is ask the patient to hold their hands out in front of them. And I'm not looking for drift here, as you see in stroke, but what I ask the patient to do is close their eyes. Now, what happens in cerebellar syndrome is the, the, the loss of control or superimposed control on motor and sensory function tends to lead to a kind of a drifting type situation. So there's a rebound is what, a rebound is what I'm looking for here. So I'm going to tap one of your hands, Peter. Try and keep it in the same position. I'm not going to tell you which one, though. So rather aggressively, you note that his hand goes down and up and back into its original position. In a rebound situation, sometimes the, the patient isn't quite sure where the, where the uh, hand is. So that I tap hard like that, and it'll go a few little overswings. Uh, and that can happen in cerebellar syndrome. And then if you open your eyes, I'm now going to move, uh, continue in and ask you to, I'm going to tip the t touch the tip of your finger and ask you to touch the tip of your nose very accurately, OK? okay. And now touch my finger and your nose and hold it. And now my finger and your nose and my finger. Now, a lot of people tend then, and then back to your nose. Now, I'm going to try and catch them out, but a lot of people tend to inappropriately move left to right, and the patient's all over the place, and you're all over the place. And it's not a question of uh, catching someone out. It's a question of depth. What you're trying to get is, can they judge depth? And so I now ask you to touch my finger and your nose, and I move away and then back. So if there's past pointing, someone with cerebellum will miss, and they go past it. Or when they come to the finger, they're just not quite sure, and they'll start to go, come towards me, and they'll get an intention tremor as they come to touch my finger. So we're looking for past pointing, intention tremor, and excessive rebound. Uh, I ask the patients, and you must give clear instructions. It's critical, because once you cl uh, clearly uh, tell, sorry, tell patients clearly what's going on, they will uh, cooperate very well. So can you put both palms out like that? And if you could put your right hand on your left palm. And then a big turnover, a little slightly exaggerated here, like that. And then back, and then forth. Back. Now we get quicker and quicker. And again, Peter's doing it perfectly right. The normal way should be like this, but if someone has a deficit in the cerebellum, their coordination will be reduced. And they'll, they'll find they can't quite get it, and they'll actually turn one hand on top of the other. And that's called dysdiadocokinesia. And then if you swap over, and you get quicker and quicker. And that's another sign of cerebellar uh, syndrome or a deficit, a problem with the cerebellum. The other features you look for are in, uh, loss of tone. But in my experience, it's not really that obvious. Patients with cerebellar uh, syndromes tend to have hypotonia. It's hard to pick up, I think. And as you can imagine with the reflexes, as we'll see later on, um, when you tap a reflex, the response going to the brain isn't as clear cut. So you tap the reflex, it should go whoop and down, obviously. But in a cerebellar syndrome, what tends to happen is you go whoop and the, you get a pendular reflex, a slight overswing. And that's, again, because the loss of control from the cerebellum is saying, oh, where, where, where's the reflex? Where's the limb in space at this time? And once you finish that, you thank the patient, as always, Welcome. and ask them to sit down. Right.